I'm not sure whether it was because I went to a high school named Sir Winston Churchill High School, but I have always been fascinated with the history and the events of World War II. And uh, it is an amazing thing to look back now, and of course with the movie Dunkirk having opened this weekend, all of that is being brought up again. It is amazing in the light of what had just happened 20 years earlier in World War I, that the Allies were as unprepared as they were. It wasn't as if Hitler hadn't made his intentions very clear. But as you think back on the history, there was months and months, especially when the British under Neville Chamberlain were trying to appease Hitler and please him in all kinds of ways. But then on September the 1st, 1939, Hitler unleashed the Blitzkrieg that went through Poland and in a matter of weeks uh, chopped it up into pieces. They'd made an alliance with the Russians. They came in from the east, the Germans from the west. The Poles had all kinds of uh, uh, army positions that were involving cavalry, actually soldiers on horses facing the German pincers as they swept through. Two days after war, uh, after they invaded, France and Britain honored their treaties and they declared war on Germany. And after they'd taken Poland, Hitler was content at least on land, the, at sea, battles were raging, but not much happened. Many began to talk about it as the Pony War. Then on May the 10th in uh, 1940, Germany had an onslaught against the, the West. The French were the most powerful force, at least it was claimed they were. They had 800,000 men in arms. They had spent millions building the Maginot Line to protect their east border. They looked at the Ardennes Forest and they said there's no way they can come through. With all of those preparations they were convinced, but they were still using weapons from World War I and they only had a few tanks, whereas Germany had 1,500 tanks. And they said there was no way for the tanks to make their way through the Ardennes Forest uh, Hitler quickly proved them wrong and they swept through the Ardennes forest. They came, instead of trying to attack the Maginot Line, came around it, came through Belgium, and the Allies were totally unprepared for what happened and they began to roll back. By May 26th, the British uh, expeditionary force was pushed back to Dunkirk and it looked like utter disaster. By uh, June the 10th, I think it was, Paris had fallen. And in six weeks, they'd moved all the way through and they'd taken all of that area. But at Dunkirk, there was that amazing event. Hitler's foolish military choices, uh, weather, other things, and the incredible response. So instead, they said at first, they thought perhaps 17,000 men could be saved. And as it happened, 400,000 were saved off the beaches and that enabled the war in one sense to still be a possibility going forward. But the reality is they were marvelously prepared, Britain and France. The only trouble is they were prepared for World War I to happen again, only this was World War II and everything had changed. And when you're not prepared, then obviously you're inviting disaster. As a matter of fact, uh, 500 years before Christ, a, a Chinese general had gathered together the wisdom of Chinese armies in a book called The Art of War. And Sun Ji says this in the middle. It was studied by the Chinese and then has become a military textbook even though it is 2,500 years old. It is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be put at risk even in a hundred battles. If you know only know yourself, but not your opponent, you may win or lose. If you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will always endanger yourself. I'm reading that because that same principle applies in spiritual warfare. If you know your enemy and you know yourself, there is a great chance of victory. If you don't know yourself or if you don't know your enemy, then you are flirting with disaster. So that's why this morning I want to think about our spiritual enemies. It was uh, George Washington who said in his very first speech to Congress on January the 8th, 1790, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective ways of preserving peace. 
Well, to be prepared for the temptations that we are going to face, for the things that we are going to confront inevitably in our Christian life means we need to know the enemy and we need to be prepared for where he's going to attack. So we're going to look at a number of different passages uh, this morning, but I want you to, as we begin, to remind ourselves that the Christian life is said by God to be a battle and a struggle. So turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, and in a minute we're going to come back to that. So here's the thing I want us to recognize. The first principle we have of preparing for our spiritual battle and spiritual realities is that we need to hear God's call that it is going to be a conflict. It is going to be a challenge. It is not going to be something that is going to be a walk in the park. It is going to be a struggle and a battle. So listen to some of these particular passages. Fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Take hold of eternal life, of the eternal life to which you were called. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, we an imperishable. I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. I love the way Phillips translates that years ago. He said, I don't shadow box. I really fight. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, abstain from, uh, from lustful passions which wage war against the soul. Hebrews chapter 12, in the first four verses, since we're surrounded by so great a host of witnesses, laying aside every sin and the, pardon, every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. For you have not yet striven, suffered unto blood, striving against sin. So the New Testament has no place within it that simply suggests that when you trust Christ, you are going to be living your best life ever, to uh, quote uh, the title of a book which is very well-selling and very bad theology. The reality is that we are going to discover our own weaknesses and challenges in new and significant ways because we face a triumvirate of evil. And that's where I want you to look at verses 1 to 3 of Ephesians. In World War II, it was the Axis powers, as they were called. The uh, Germans, the Italians, the Japanese that combined together against the Allies. They were united in purpose. They were united in goal. But they were different in strategy. They were different in the ways in which they carried things out. So you needed to be prepared for very different kinds of attacks, as the United States learned to its own regret on Pearl Harbor Day, when all of a sudden they were not prepared and devastation occurred. So let's read these verses together. Peter, pardon me, Paul is talking about our life before Christ, and he says, and you were dead in the trespasses, in, uh, trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the course of this age, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the passions, the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, what Paul diagnoses is, here's where we were before we came to Christ. We were under the control, first of all, we were living our lives according to the course of this age, the course of this world. It's a term that we'll come back to in just a moment that looks at the surrounding culture under the control of Satan, living on values that leave God out of active play. And then there is also the, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the sons of disobedience. 
And so we're reminded again of the reality of Satan and his work in holding us in spiritual bondage. And then the other thing that is mentioned when we get to verse 3 is, among whom we all lived our lives in the passions of our flesh. So when we talk about the world and the flesh and the devil, we are talking about the three enemies that, as it were, dominated our lives before we came to know Christ. And then God calls us, as Paul puts it in Colossians, he called us out of the kingdom of darkness into the king of the son of his love, into the kingdom of his son. So now we are in another kingdom, and yet the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of darkness are in conflict with one another. So the Forces that once held us now look us at us as it were uh, escapees, and they're determined to get us back. So we face this cohort of these three things that work against us in our spiritual life, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So I want to look at three passages that describe what their tactics are, and then I want to come back to those same three passages and look at what God says is how we deal with them. So the first is the world. And 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, talk about the world. Now, John uses the word world in a variety of ways. The world is that which was created by God, so you have the physical universe. The world is the object of God's love in terms of its people whom he cares for. So God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But the world is also an organized system in opposition to God. So you'll notice he says here in verses 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father or love for the father is not in him. For all that is in the world the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, pride in possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So let me just define it again. When the Bible speaks about the world in this way, it speaks about an organized system that is ultimately under the control of Satan. Because in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it will say, the whole world lies under the evil one. Or Jesus will describe Satan. You remember how he does in John chapter 12 when he says, the prince of this world is coming. Now, that's not talking about the globe. It is talking about the organized system of unbelieving humanity, which lives its values to leave out the living God its values and its desires and its function of life. In many ways, it's the surrounding culture and, and the surrounding kind of ethos of the world. We're beginning to feel in the time in which we live the distancing between the Christian values and the current values of our time and where they are. But the principle the world lives on is conformity. It wants us to obey. You remember what Paul says, don't be conformed to this age, to this world, because it wants us to live according to its values, to jump on board the values, and it will adopt the values to the needs of people. That's one of the most remarkable things about the world system is how flexible it is in, in a bad way, because you look back and you think that things are actively promoted today that would have been looked on with absolute disgust 20 years ago, but now they're heralded and you are a hate-filled bigot if you do not go along and sign on to the values of the time that are built around lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of possessions. That's what brings those two things together. And the world wants to squeeze us, as again, Phillips translates beautifully, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So one of the great challenges is to understand that the world is pushing on us and pressing on us in particular ways. 
to try and make us adopt its values, to live by its standards, to adopt its conviction. So as a Christian, we are also always going to be, as it were, living against the stream. The form the world takes in the United States is not the same form it takes in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. And yet the underlying principle is to live your life in a way that's distinct. That's why I was brought up and worldliness involves certain things. You didn't drink, you didn't dance, you didn't smoke, you didn't go to movies, you didn't do those things. And if you did them, you were worldly. And if you didn't, you weren't worldly. But you could be as worldly as the devil and still not do all of those things. Because the devil's after our hearts and the world's after our hearts and our values. And so we need to understand that. Now the second of our enemies is the flesh. And there's many places where this is mentioned, but let's turn back to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, Peter has, uh, pardon me, Peter. I've been studying Peter this week because in the fall we're going to be studying Peter. So I don't know why when I'm preaching Paul I want to call him Peter, and when I'm preaching Peter, I know I'll be calling him Paul most of the time, but bear with me. Verse 13, you were called to freedom, brothers, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And then he goes to verse 16, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against God. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the word flesh is one of the hardest ideas to get our heads around because almost immediately we think of the physical body. But that's not what Paul is thinking about. The flesh is that power within us of rebellion against God. It is in our bodies in that sense. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, before I trust Christ, I am in the flesh. That is, I am under its control and its direction. But when I trust Christ, I'm not in the flesh. I'm in Christ. But the flesh is still in me. It is an internal traitor when I'm free of my body. So it's somehow connected to my body. When I am free from my body or when I have my resurrection body, I won't struggle against the flesh. But it isn't my flesh. There are desires of the flesh that are planted by God. The desire for food, the desire to satisfy thirst, the desire for sexual pleasure within marriage, all of those things are good in and of themselves. But Satan takes the good things or sin takes the good things and twists them. So they become something different than that. So maybe those of you who understand that much better than I will recognize that the sin or the flesh is the virus in our software. It is the malware that is in there that is trying to take over the whole system. And you know very well if you're living at all in the world in which you're dealing with computers or your iPhones or iPads or whatever, <laughs> you know very well you better have a security system because there are people launching viruses and inwardly the flesh is going to act in that particular way. And the call of the flesh is indulge me. So Paul uses the term don't use your uh, freedom as a liberty for or as a springboard for the flesh. And then he goes on to say the flesh lusts against the spirit, desires against the spirit. So if the pull of the world is toward conformity. The pull of the flesh is toward indulgence. And the two work together. I mean, that's one of the things about these three powers, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan is sort of the dominant power using the world and using the flesh, and they work in distinct ways. So the flesh is calling me to indulge myself to give myself a break today. You deserve a break today. And to set aside the will of God and its directions and to follow that in that particular way. Now the devil, let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 
And as Peter is ending his book, in chapter 5, he has been speaking about leaders in the church, and then he turns to the issue of how we relate to one another. Matter of fact, verse uh, 5 is one of those verses that I think gives a key biblical principle. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, under, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Now, our modern world finds it very hard to believe in the devil. And having been trained and brought up in the system um, and all of that, it's not always easy for me to think of the devil. But Jesus believed him in, the Bible believes in him, and any wise person would rather follow God's word and God's son than just follow what our contemporary ethos is. Satan is a real being, utterly opposed to God. He defines himself in opposition to God. As a matter of fact, the two terms that are given to him, your adversary, the one who is opposed to you, the devil, and the word diabolos means the slanderer, the one who is speaking against God and speaking against his purposes. And we can think about demonic beings and all of these other kinds of things that come, but ultimately it is to Satan that we're referring. C.S. Lewis said something very wise years ago. There are two equal and opposite errors into which we can fall regarding Satan and his demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to have an excessive and unhealthy interest in him. Satan is equally pleased with both. You remember what we sang earlier? The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we shall endure, for lo, his doom is sure. And powerful as Satan still is, he is a defeated enemy, and we do not live in fear and attribute to him everything that happens. I love the story of uh, a little boy who was fighting and into all kinds of trouble, and his mother came in and grabbed him away and said, Jimmy, Jimmy, what is the matter with you? The devil's got a hold of you. And he said, well, the devil may have punched him in the eye, but biting him in the leg was my idea. <laughs> and I've met all kinds of Christians who blame things on the devil that are things that they must take responsibility for. But what is the primary tactic? If the primary tactic of the world is conformity, if the primary tactic of the flesh is indulgence, the primary tactic of Satan is deception, leading us to doubt God. And so uh, Jesus will say of Satan, he's the liar from the beginning. Paul will say that the prince of this world blinds the eyes so that they cannot see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation would talk about him as the one who deceives the nations. But he deceives the nations to call doubt and disbelief to God. You remember the very first sin, what was it? The response to Satan's challenge. Did God really say? And Satan calls Eve into, into doubt by deceiving her relating to the word of God. And it's the same thing with, uh, come to the book of Job, we come to Jesus as he's on the mountain and Satan is working to deceive and to get him to pay homage to cause him to doubt the nature and character of God. So let's come back to all of those and think through if those are the tactics, if those are the supreme things. So the world's going to squeeze me into its mold. The flesh is going to demand indulgence. 
of its desires, and Satan is going to cause me to look up to God and say, I don't believe you, or just to quietly doubt him. How do we respond? Well, back to 1 John. It's interesting that as John puts it, he says, love not the world, nor the things of the world, for all that is in the world is not of the world of God, but is of the world. And then he talks in other ways. Now, if the call of the world is to love it, the antidote to loving the world is to love God more. It is what an old preacher called the expulsive power of a higher affection. And I've used the illustration before, whatever thoughts I had toward any other women, when I met Elizabeth, sorry, you just weren't attractive anymore. Uh, I had a higher affection. And in the significant way, that's true of God. That's why one of the great themes of the book of 1 John is about loving God. We love because he first loved us. Everyone who is loved is born of God. As a matter of fact, do you remember what Paul says about one of his co-workers? He says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this, this present world. Now, how do we love God? We love God, as Jesus says, by keeping his commandments, by obeying him. Look at verse um, 17 more closely. It says, the world is passing away and it's desire, it's lust. That's what it's built on. But he who does the will of God abides forever. There's the two different principles. The desires of the flesh and the will of God. I don't want to um, dwell on this too much, except we see it amazingly being played out in our current culture or context, where one side is telling us, well, those are the desires they have in their heart. They must be allowed to express them. It is unloving to not allow someone to express those desires because they're coming from their heart. But the will of God says no. Sexual relationships are between a man and a woman only within the bounds of marriage. And that clash, that's why what is going on is much deeper than simply a theological issue. It is a call to live by one of two bases. In terms of the values the world says are now, this is the arc of history, get on the right side of history, adopt all these things, or listen to the will of God. So, we're called to love God and, and to follow his will. Do you remember how Jesus responded to Satan? Every time Satan came to him, he quotes scripture. Bow down. God said you worship God alone. Turn the stones into bread. You shall um, feed on the word of God and so forth. Constantly coming back to God. If Jesus committed himself against Satan and the world by entrusting himself to the will of God, so must we. Then the flesh. Well, let's go back to Galatians chapter 5 once again. It's interesting as Paul speaks here about the flesh that calls for indulgence. And Paul is saying, yes, it does. But there is another person placed within you, and that is the spirit. And the spirit and the flesh are locked in an unending conflict with one another. <laughs> So Paul says in verse 17, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want. Now what that's saying is you're kind of caught between. The flesh says indulge and the spirit says obey. And then another time the spirit says obey and the flesh says no, I want my do my thing. And Paul says, you are, in one sense, helpless, so you have to make a choice. And you notice he uses three terms. First of all, in verse 16, he says, walk in the Spirit. That means to live 
in dependence upon the Spirit. Then in verse 18, he says that those who um, are led by the Spirit know what God wants to give them in terms of not following the flesh, to quote it properly. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Legalism is not the way in which you keep down the flesh. It's depending upon God's spirit. And then he uses the language again in verse 25, which we haven't read yet. He says, if we live by the spirit, and we do, that's where our spiritual life comes from. Let us also, and he uses a very interesting word here. He says, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us walk in line with the spirit. We have a certain member of our family who I won't um, mention who it is, but when you go for a walk with this particular person, they love to walk at their own particular way, and you're walking along, and they'll walk in front of you or walk beside you or whatever is going on, and it gets a little bit challenging to walk there. You can sit up, Connor. It's nothing. <laughs> Nobody knows if I was even talking about you. But the point is that... If you're going to walk, you want to walk in line with someone. And that's what God is calling us to do related to the Holy Spirit, to live in line with God's purposes for us. Then let's go back to that last one. Back to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 is really important that we notice what is put where. And if we miss this, we'll miss the central thing that is being said. Now he's going to come to the warning in verse 8. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's determined. He's dangerous. But before ever he warns us about Satan, he told us in verse 6, Humble yourself under the hand of God. And then in verse 9, he will say, resist him, firm in the faith. But our first step is to humble ourselves before God. James chapter 4 says exactly the same thing. Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil. And we're called, again, to stand against that by submitting ourselves to God. But submitting ourselves to God comes back again. If you remember in Ephesians chapter 6, we are told that we're to take our stand <coughs> against principalities and powers and the forces of darkness. And we're to put on the whole armor of God. And in the whole armor of God, there is one offensive weapon, which is what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So there's a certain sense in which what Ephesians is saying and what Peter is saying are the same thing. Humble yourselves under God. Put on the armor of God. Resist firm in the faith. Take up the Word of God because what his goal is to get you to doubt the Word of God. So there we have it. We live on a battlefield. We live in the midst of a spiritual war. There are none of us who are exempt from the reality that if we put our trust in Christ, we are part of the kingdom of God's Son. But in this present world, there is the internal enemy of the flesh. There is the external enemy of the world. And there is the infernal, the demonic enemy of Satan. And we live our lives against those pressures. But God has given us what we need to live in a way that glorifies him. The Christian life does not offer the promise of victory without struggle. It offers the privilege of victory in the midst of ongoing struggle. And you will be struggling with Satan all the way to either the rapture or your death. As Satan will be working, the flesh will be working, the world will be working. But God is working within us for his glory. 10th Avenue North has a song 
in which they keep coming back to the same refrain, which is a simple one. Hallelujah, we are free to struggle. We're not struggling to be free. Your love bought and makes us children. So children, drop your chains and sing. We sing because we've not only been set free from the kingdom of the world, the flesh, and the devil, but God is at work within us, willing and doing of his good pleasure to complete that which he has begun in us for his glory. But we need to be battle ready. We need to live recognizing that all kinds of things come against us. And only as we fight in God's terms will we know victory. One of those things is to keep coming back to the center of it all. Where Satan was defeated, where the flesh was overcome, where the world was demonstrated as empty of having ultimate sacrifice, and that's to the cross. And to the reality of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us there. So we come again this morning as we do every Sunday morning to the table of the Lord Jesus. The reminder of what he did for us, of what he bore for us, of what he is doing within us for his glory. And remind ourselves again of what it means to be part of the kingdom of the shepherd of love who gave himself for us. Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows. But we considered him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquity. The chastisement to bring about our peace was laid on him with his wounds. We were healed. All we like sheep had gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It pleased the Lord to crush him, putting him to grief. It would make his soul an offering for sin. He would see his seed. He would prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hands. We, amazingly, are the good pleasure of the Lord. He endured that so that we might be his family. This is the table of the Lord Jesus, not the table of Redeemer Fellowship. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he invites you to take these symbols. If you've not yet trusted him, he invites you to come and bow at his feet and say, my Lord and my God, thank you. You died for me and rose again. I trust you and follow you.